We shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Ajay Paul, who needs no introduction. Again, a very good friend of mine is the director of the BBI Foundation Group of Hospitals in Calcutta. And a, yes, an amazing, uh, astute, prolific surgeon. And he's going to show us some truly amazing uh, surgical uh, acrobatics with iris deficiency in cataract surgery. Thank you, Dr. Chitra and team ARC AIOS for having me in this August gathering to present a few of those cases. So I'll be speaking on iris deficiency associated with cataract surgery. Now the iris, you know, it regulates the amount of light by, by you know, changing the diameter and the size of the pupil. So it gives us good quality of vision, reduces aberrations and reduces that excessive light that can go and cause glare, and decreasing the depth of focus and Cosmetic, cosmetic concern is also there for the iris is concerned. Now, when you come to these conditions, basically they are congenital and acquired in a clinical condition which they come to us, and iridia is one, you might meet it once or maybe in your whole practice life, very few cases. Coloboma is something that you meet quite often. Ocular albinism is, again, you could meet it, but the acquired ones were the ones which you have practiced. In my 25 years of practice, I've definitely met quite a lot of them. Iridoid iridosis, metriasis, the iris tear in the penetrating trauma, iatrogenic iris iridotum, and post uveitis, you may have you know, all sorts of people with size and post drug response, especially after TAS. If you know, TAS, you can end up with a dilated pupil which doesn't go down. So the restoration and the size of the function depends on whether you can do it on the ocular surface. It could be a cosmetic contact lens in the early stages, a corneal plane level. You can do corneal tattering or intracorneal stromal implants, where these are not easily clinically practiced as much. But what is more important is the iris plane, where you could do the suturing or you could put these PIDs or prosthetic iris devices. Non surgical management before the cataract sets in, you could try out tinted glasses or fluid patches, tinted contact lenses, artificial pupil, pupil contact lenses. But then they are the ones you are biding your time till the cataract sets in or the patient is visually handicapped by the cataract that is coming. So the surgical planning is basically the sutures. One can use those, repair those small defects, the iris, the artificial iris implants for the larger defects, modified capsular tension rings. Now these are ones two, the iris reconstruction lenses and the rollable silicon wrappers. So this has not been available to us clinically. I don't know whether uh, any of us have done it. Well, there are three basic companies, European companies, basically Mocher, Optech, and Human Optics. We got the care group, which manufactures is for us here. I have no financial interest in that, but whatever devices we have used is the care group people. So these are the Coloboma lenses. The one we get here is around 5.5 millimeter optic. Now this also remains bigger, but then you get the Mocher ones, which are smaller in size also, the multi-segment and any the rings. And of course, then with the segments. Now let's, these are the ones which are there in the literature in the, the artists and uh, the iris reconstructive eyewells where you can, you know, you can put a seat here and the color of the iris can be matched and you can match the size of the pupil along with that. But let's come to the ones, the iridolysis, iridodialysis repair, which you may meet it quite often. And um, these are the suture techniques. Now this is a, uh, as you can see, there is an iridolysis here. I'll be doing the railroad technique and later on be showing a single pass four throw technique. You can end up with an updrawn pupil at the end of the surgery. Here I'm using the iris soap to get me the, uh, the area for I do the emulsification. It's a routine emulsification that goes on. And as I go forward, I finish it, I put in the lens. And then I would see the, I would tap the iris and see what size it gets. Is it uh, the right size? And then uh, tapping it, getting into the central area. Then it's very important that you take that bite here. There is, I'm doing a two millimeter away from the limbus, a small scleral group. You can use uh, the, the, the scleral flaps or you can use the Hoffman's pocket here. A straight needle, a ninopoline, that's what I use. Take a bite and be careful that you don't take it too much into the, in the body of the iris so that you, the iris will be pulled too much away. So it should be just enough to get you the bite, but at the same time, it should not be too peripheral so that you, you know, you cheese, there is the cheese wearing where the iris tears off, where the suture is tied and the knot is tied there, and then you can tap it and get it to the right size many times, as I said, 
it could be a, the denervation of the iris can lead to a bit of overwhelm in erratic people, but you can put it with the, those uh, forceps and get it to the right size. The next case I will be showing is uh, itrogenic. Now, this was a patient which has referred to us. It had a, a foldable lens in the anterior chamber. It stayed there for almost a year before the patient developed a lot of irritation and inflammation and cornea. And once you tried to put it, the whole iris did not. This could happen even when a beginner does an SICS, the whole a black nucleus, you can get the whole iris out. In this case, we tried to disengage that uh, lens there. And as we did that, we put in visco and tried to position the iris there. See, the iris is almost this insertion, almost 270 degrees, almost this part, and just we put in some air and visco, left it like that. And after one month, we took up this case. There was a lot of inflammation, the inflammatory you know, membranes were there. We did a vitrectomy, and this, and since this was a, quite a lot of area that had come out, it had already adhered here. So the main uh, See, you can see this is already adherent here. So we went with, ahead with the same the railroad technique there. We took one bite there and there, took it out and continued with the second arterialized insertion there and continued it there. And once we got it there, we finished up with the vitrectomy and putting an SFI in this. So it's very important how you place those uh, iris towards the sclera and attach it there. Now, this is a case. We've done a, a, a subluxated lens, a traumatic subluxated. You can see the C, uh, all these Sioni ring is there. This was a femto subluxated. And then we wanted to get that iris the right size. Now, this is the single pass four throw technique where you can get the iris without uh, going on the macular suture or getting the or going inside the eye. So, this is where you get that loop out. This is so popular as by the Kamar Agarwal. And you can see one, two, three, four. You can get that uh, four knots and then get it uh, the iris. And then you assess well, how much and do you need one more suture. In this case, we went to the second suture there to get this iris right in the center, the pupil right in the center. Once you got it there, the second knot there, and then use it. And then you can see the knot there, the fourth throw. And got it in the center, and then assess the size of the pupil as it dried, use that uh, forceps to pull it up, and we got it, so we found that this is quite central, it's round. So we just completed with the third knot there. Once you finish this end of the surgery, we just had a nice round pupil. Now this is a mitratic pupil, which uh, we had done a, uh, a traumatic subluxative cataract, and this was an atrophic iris. As you can see, this is the bursting pupilloplasty technique. This will go one side and then put it round, second, third, fourth, and most of the time they are non reactive, end up in a stellate form. And we have to be careful not to pull it too much. There could be a cheese of wearing, and the sphincter of the pupil is too small. And in this case, as you can see, we have to add a few more sutures to it, and then we got a stellate appearance. But Actually, that got the patient rid of the, uh, the photophobia that is at it, uh, attached to it. And now this was a case of iridogenesis this genesis syndrome. Now these cases normally you would not be successful doing this the technique of uh, suturing the iris because these are quite well apart, as we learned in this case. And at the end of the case, we just tried to suture the iris, and there was a cheese wearing because you could not afford it. But in these sort of cases, what you need is the the NIRADIA segments, which will come to the next segment. Now, these are the cases which need NIRADIA or coloboma segments where you get you know, different sizes. Now, this patient is waiting for the second stage of the surgery. Then we have ordered it and we'll be getting it very soon. Now, the multi segmented NIRADIA rings are another thing. Now, this is a case where you can see this is where this is where you do a capsulorexis at just around 4.54. 0.5 to 5 millimeter, and these multi-segmented ones, you do the phaco multiplication and increase the incision because you cannot do it with this uh, almost 3.5 to 4 millimeter incision. This is the first ring going in, and you can just maneuver it right in. You need to use a high molecular viscoelastic. These are actually very brittle, honestly, very careful 
getting that and the incision should be a bit more than what you would do because this needs at least 3.5 millimeter but the four millimeters where you can uh, be comfortable once this is there you got, got the the ring in the back the second ring goes in behind it one has to be very careful by maneuvering it into the bag once you've got it there the bimanual way put the bag put the lens put that ring in the bag and the only minus point is that you ultimately get around six millimeter pupil here. The glare might still remain, but that's the best you can do if you want to put it right into the bag. And this is the last case where we are showing. This was again a hydrogenic, uh, the iris had gone. This was referred to us. You can see a small belt of iris left there. This was the original incision and ascites. So these. Uh, you can see the NRAD eye wells, they are actually around uh, 8.75, so actually need around 9 millimeter incisions, and the optic is around 5.5 millimeters. So you need a bigger incision. This is what we are doing in a temporarily, and then open it up, put the lens there. See, the lens is on. There's an addition of the iris that is there. We just cleaned it, and you've got a nice uh, capsular rim which is there. The lens is maneuvered, goes behind that. A little bit of iris there. And these are generally, you can, if you put it in the effective, also you can use it as a SFI well. But most of these lenses in the long term can, uh, these eyes can be glucometers. So the ultimate answer in these would be the customized uh, artificial irises. You can roll it and put it inside. Well, I have no clinical experience with this. I know some, some panelists might be having. These are the artificial irises with fibers and without fiber where you have got, you can adhere it, you can tie it up in the sclera and just like any other uh, devices that we are using, spiral fixation. So to end patients with congenital acquired defects of the eyes are challenging. Caring of this patient is very gratifying and they're usually appreciative of any improvement that is there. And so you may not meet in, uh, in our daily practice, but once you have one has to be right on the topic and the right instrument and the right techniques to still used to implant this and do this iris and the suture. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Dr. Ajay. That was amazing and a wonderful selection of videos. I think it has been a, a real learning for all of us. I have a, a question for uh, uh, you. Like, supposing you have done a pinhole pupilloplasty and the pupil actually becomes very small and this patient needs a later retinal evaluation. Have any of you all had an experience that you have, what have you all done? Would you have done a YAG laser suturalysis of this uh, uh, thing or how have you dealt with such a situation? I have not, uh, as you said, this, uh, I've left it around 1.5 or 2 millimeter, the, the cases. I do not, I mean, the pinhole people plastic for different, like keratoconus or high astigmatism, I have no experience. In. But then I think that's the only way where if you want to see the periphery, if you have a retinal problem, doing a sphincterolysis or going by the side port and using a uh, micro scissor, opening it up if you have to see. But that's the only negative point. I mean, when you have those pinhole, very small pupil, but then one, if you're uh, living at 1.5 to 2 millimeter pupil, I think you can see the retina quite well. Uh, uh, Dr. Sufek Chevi, if you have a traumatic uh, uh, iridodialysis and also a lax uh, capsular bag, uh, and which actually it's large, that you need a CTS to be placed, would you be daring to do both in the same sitting or would you take care of the capsular bag and IOL and later consider doing taking care of the iridodialysis? Um, thanks for your question. I've had a patient who had both dialysis as well, iridodialysis as well as zonulysis. And, you know, in fact, when you're dealing with a cataract, that's the best time to deal with the iris issue. Because if you have an intact bag without the zonules, you can still do a capsularexis and implant the lens, the artificial iris, into the capsular bag with the LL. And then I put in the CTR and the CTS. And with the CTS, I anchor that to the sclera. So that actually means that the implant is inside the capsular bag and you get less, less risk of glaucoma and other issues. Whereas if you dealt with it you know, secondarily, you would have to suture 
that artificial iris directly to the sclera and the patient has a higher risk of glaucoma. Okay. And uh, what would be the tip for a beginner surgeon uh, to prevent iris tears when you are passing, taking a bite into the iris? Dr. Ajay, would you tell? Yeah, uh, you, uh, I have shown that you use a forceps. I mean, instead of doing it blindly, use a micro forceps, hold it and a bit away from the, the margin. I mean, you should have a, enough of the or else many a times, or if you're taking a, a 26 gauge needle, you just take, put it in the opposite side and then go it just the right side. I mean, it may be trial and error till you get that the right amount and the eye has to be steady and you can hold it and get it. One has to be very careful. You don't do it too much posterior so that you, you'll make the, the bump there sort of, you know, or you make it too periphery that you, you know, do a you know, cheesing off or the tearing of the eyes. Yes, Dr. Kamal. Uh, I think I, I agree with Dr. Ajay. I, I have got, I've been doing it with 20, uh, uh, six gauge needle also, but I've realized over time that, you know, it tends to leave a big hole there when you do the railroad technique and, you know, you go through the needle with the 26 gauge. So what I've started doing recently is I've started using the ILM peeling forceps uh, of the, my retina team. And it works amazing. You know, just a small little side port and the, the forceps, ILM peeling forceps goes. And it has a very small hole. It doesn't damage the iris. And I just hold it where I want the needle to pass through. And I just hold it with the forceps and I go with the needle next to it. And I can repair the iris uh, very well with that. So I don't have large gaping holes or atrophic patches in the iris. Just a small tip. Uh, fantastic presentation, Ajay. But uh, just to add to what you said, uh, uh, what both you and Kamal said, using a forceps and holding the iris gently gives you more control. But instead of passing the 26 gauge needle, if you're using a 90 needle, keep the 26 gauge needle outside the iris, pass the uh, oh, 90 yeah. needle through the straight needle through the iris, and then do the railroading. You find that uh, the larger bore of the 26 gauge. Uh, Tends to cause There's, more iris damage. That's more of a support. I mean, you put the 26 gauge, take the needle and take it on that and then slide it through. Because you need, because once the, it comes out through the opposite, you might lose balance and then somebody, something there. And there there's a support sort of. And that's what we do in an SFLR, just pass it through and that acts as a support. Especially when you're trying to maneuver those uh, long needles. I mean, if, if it is uh, eye wear, you know, the, by, the nose is you know, <laughs> obstructing. So that in a deep set eye, it needle. can be a very, very big problem yes. in a deep set eye. You do need that's a 26 gauge needle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah hi, just... We have more speakers. So I think, yes, yes Susan. Uh, uh, first of all, let me just say hello. I, I didn't join in in the beginning, but then there was another meeting, the AI was meeting itself, which I had to, and then so I joined back now. I've, I didn't attend the entire discussion that just happened, but I think that it's about the uh, opening that can come on the iris when you do the pupiloplasty. Uh, I don't know whether it's already been mentioned, but a 30 gauge needle uh, does decrease that uh, the incidence of that happening a lot. So we have completely stopped using 26 gauge. We have been using only 30 gauge. And even with that, a little bit of movement or a little bit of excess pulling or, you know, traction when you uh, do it can cause a hole within atrophic iris, especially not in, not in healthy normal iris, but in atrophic iris that can happen. So 30 gauge needle is uh, much more useful. And uh, like Dr. Kamal said also, forceps can also sometimes help in just decreasing that, uh, that hole from happening. One of the most important things is how you maneuver it. So actually these are supposed to be done with curved needles, but since we don't have curved needles, we all do it with the straight needles. The curved needles gives you a much better way of, uh, you know, being able to hold it. So in a worst case situation where let's say the eye is very deep or something, you can actually curve it out just with your hand a little bit and then Absolutely. you 